Good evening. Welcome to New Horizons. If you have a mobile phone, if you want to put it on site, please, thank you. My massive welcome to Terry Borman, with Britain's responsibility in 1914 and its relation to our current world situation. Author Terry, you've got a recent book now available, Mapping the Millennium, Behind the Plans of the New World Order. <coughs> Tonight, historian and meticulous researcher, Terry, takes us back 100 years to World War I, sometimes called the Great War in so much as it was big. Horrendous loss of life, a soldier signed up to fight, only just into their teen years, just boys. Terry points to the causative factors of this conflict being contrary to what officially currently carries the name of truth, and the intimate link between the instigators of the war and the New World Order, thought by some to be modern in origin. Terry also underscores the importance of mankind's need to know the truth about this war when we realise what may be at stake today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Terry Ball. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. And can you hear me all right at the back? Yes. Yep? Good. Okay. Um, so, Britain's responsibility in 1914 and its relation to today. I first got interested in this subject when I was 12 years old. At uh, that time, the um, BBC did uh, a series on TV, some of you may remember it, in the early 60s. It uh, went on for about 24 episodes, called The Great War. And um, it's quite a remarkable thing, you can still see it on YouTube. Um, and it's remarkable because, well it was for me remarkable at that time, because as somebody brought up in the 50s as a child and seeing lots of war movies on TV, there was all about the Second World War. But we saw nothing in those days about the First World War. And like I'm sure many of you, I had grandparents involved in the First World War. And I was very close to my grandmother. And she was actually one of the first women soldiers even. And she also told me about the experiences of her relatives some of whom were killed, some of whom were badly injured. Um, and so I heard a lot about it from her. But when this series, The Great War, was produced on BBC in 1964, then suddenly one saw all this amazing footage. And it was suddenly as if the world of my grandparents was visible for the first time. Not only tiny little clips, but long extended ones. And that was really eye-opening. And so that really started me studying it. And very quickly I got interested in the event which sort of really starts the whole thing off. Um, in 1914, 28th of June, Sarajevo, today Bosnia. Uh, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. She often gets love left out and she shouldn't because there's a very interesting story behind um, this couple, which I can't go into the whole, all of it today, except to say that it was a love story between two people from different nationalities. Um, she was regarded, she was a Slav, he was an Austrian, member of the Habsburg dynasty, and he married beneath him, so to speak, and he married for love, not for dynasty. And he encountered terrific resistance to his marriage. And they were basically shunned by the rest of uh, Viennese high society and, of course, by the imperial family. But he was the heir apparent. He was the crown prince. And the emperor was in his 80s and soon to die. So at any time, Franz Ferdinand could have become the emperor. And in 1900, he chose to marry this Czech lady from a noble family which wasn't high enough to marry into the imperial family. That's why they were shunned. It was a morganatic marriage. He had to give up all the rights for his children to inherit and so on in order to marry this woman. And it was interesting, you see, because after all, the Germans, the Austrians, they were on the top in the empire. 
The other people who were on the top in the empire were the Hungarians. That's why it was called the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they rather sat on top of all the other nationalities, particularly the Slavs and the Czechs, of course, Slavs. Now, the empire was somewhat ramshackle, and Franz Ferdinand felt that the way to save the empire in the 20th century was to change it from being a dual monarchy, a system where two nationalities, two nationalities were on the top, so to speak, to one where three were, a trial or a triadic monarchy or empire. So the Slavs would have equal rights with the Austrians and the Hungarians. Now, this is where the first important point comes, you see, because one often hears, well, if they hadn't killed this man, then they would have killed somebody else and the war would have started that way. But no, the assassins chose their man very carefully. And it was very significant that this man and his wife, the symbol, if you like, of this relationship between a German and a Slav, um, that these people should be killed. And particularly because, as I say, Franz Ferdinand wanted to make peace in the empire. He didn't want war with anybody. He didn't want war with any Slavic people. He didn't want war with, with uh, Russia, with, uh, with any of the Slavic countries, and particularly not with their troublesome neighbor, Serbia, also a South Slavic country. And that meant that Franz Ferdinand, well, this is the family, and this is the assassin, Gavrilo Princip. Uh, I'll just mention, it's often interesting, he was only 19 at the time, a Bosnian ultra-nationalist student, and he basically believed in uh, a, a South Slavic state, independence, so, but he wanted Bosnia to come out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and join with the other South Slavic countries, what later would become Yugoslavia only not under the control of Serbia. He didn't want the Serbs to control this new Slav South Slav state. Um, but he was prepared to kill for that. And so he did. Um, I won't go into the circumstance of the assassination. That's a fascinating story in itself, how it happened and how it almost didn't happen. Um, but this, this is the, uh, the couple and this is their, their children. Um, his name, Gavrilo Princip, it's often interesting to notice the names of people in history. Because his name, Gavrilo Princip, means Gabriel Prince, or Prince Gabriel. He's named after an archangel. But an archangel of the moon. And an archangel who has a specific role, as it were, in traditional culture. Which has very much to do with the earth and with nationality, you might say. And Gabrielo Princip, the Gabriel Principal, Prince Gabriel, he was the man who actually, as I say, with his first shots, these two shots, which killed the two, the, the royal couple almost immediately, um, his two shots really were the opening shots of the whole Great War. And it was very important that this couple should die, particularly from the point of view of this man. His name is Dragutin Dmitrievich, and he was the commander of the Serbian military intelligence. He was also the ruler, or the rather, I should say, the commander of the group which called itself the Black Hand, a secret society. Here's its device here. And its motto, uni unity or death. And his goal was to create a South Slavic state under the control of the Serbs. So he was very much a Serbian nationalist. So in that sense, his goal was not quite the same as the young men who actually carried out the murder. So he really wanted Serbia to be on top. Um, he had been involved in an assassination already in 1903. They had murdered together with uh, the Serbian officer corps. They had murdered the Serbian royal family in a, in a horrendous deed which had shocked the whole of Europe butchered them to death in the royal palace, threw their bodies naked over the uh, balcony. Everybody was totally shocked, except for the Russian ambassador, Nicholas Hardwig, because Nicholas Hardwig was involved with the whole thing, and he, as it were, oversaw it, because Nicholas Hardwig saw Serbia as an instrument of Russia's goals in the Balkans. So he was a pan-Slavist and a Russianist. He wanted Russia to lead the Slavs. And at every step of the game, 
he was determined to use Serbia to destroy Austria-Hungary so that Russia could achieve its aims of becoming uh, the leader of the Slavic peoples. Remember, this is a time 100 years ago of tremendous nationalism, such as we don't have now. We only have minor nationalism in Europe today compared to 100 years ago. Um, so he was one of those who was very much involved in the South Slavic nationalist movement in the Balkans. But also, there was this guy, James D. Bourchier, the Times Balkan correspondent. And Mr. Bourchier and Mr. Hartley were both involved in putting together the Balkan League to bring together the little Balkan countries which would fight against Turkey in 1912-1913. That was the conflict which led on to the Great War in 1914. So it's interesting to see an Englishman involved in all of this. You know, the uh, Iranians have a saying. They say, if you want to find out about the problems in the world, lift up a stone and you'll find an Englishman. <laughs> and uh, here we have um, the Times correspondent. In those days, Times correspondents were really important people. Remember, the Times was the leading uh, media organ for the educated classes. And Times correspondents in those days were regarded as extremely knowledgeable, well-read, well-traveled, and so on. So you would have your gentlemen in your gentlemen's club sipping their whiskies, reading their Times newspaper about the foreign news, what's going on in the continent. And they would really cite or quote from these Times correspondents. So they had tremendous impact on the, on the public, the educated public of those days. And then behind Mr. Hartley, who, as I say, was seeking to use the Serbs to bring about Russia's goals, we have the Russian Foreign Secretary, Sazanov, assisted by the Minister of War, Sukhomlinov, and the Chief of the General Staff, Staff Yanushkevich. And it would be these three men in June, July 1914, who would lead Russia into war and would bring about the first mobilization of the great powers. And that really started the ball rolling. Because when Russia allied itself with France in 1892, and the generals who did that deal, the Russian general and the French general, they were quite clear with each other that mobilization meant war. You didn't have to wait for a declaration. As soon as a nation mobilized, that was the first act of war. And for all the great powers, this was the case. That's how their generals and their governments saw it. It wasn't so much a declaration of war which was important by this time. The technology had taken things to the point where you had to move fast. You had to mobilize your forces quickly. And to gain an edge even over a few days or a few hours was vital. So mobilization, once you committed to mobilization, that was it. You couldn't go back. So um, these three men uh, were the ones who, as I say, started Russia's mobilization um, in uh, July 1914. And they were also, these Russians, were backed, so to speak, now we go a little bit further into the, down the rabbit hole, as it were, by another three, or rather two. Here's Sazanov again. And his hands were being held in this whole process which led to the First World War by the French ambassador, Maurice Paleologue, and the British ambassador, Sir George Buchanan. Because remember, at that time, France was already allied to Russia, and so that's a formal alliance, and Britain had an informal entente, as we call it. Not a, a formal alliance with all the obligations thereof, but an entente, an agreement, basically, to cooperate with the Russians. So it was these two, in the crisis of June, July, early August 1914, um, who kind of kept Sazanov on track and took him up to the edge. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can go there. They did nothing. This is important. They did nothing, neither of these two men, to restrain the Russians for their first, uh, first movement of um, mobilization. So let's step back a minute 
from 1914 to today. Um, this particular rogues gallery, <laughs> some of you may have seen them in action in recent months uh, on TV or on the radio, um, particularly Paxman and Portillo, they've done documentaries. And then, of course, politicians Michael Gove and Boris Johnson have made statements in the press about the First World War as we approach the anniversary. And you probably know that the government committed to spend 50 million on the celebrating the centenary. And then uh, here we have Sir Max Hastings, military historian, who wrote the book Catastrophe, which is the big bestseller on this subject, or supposed to be last year in our one remaining nationwide bookshop, Waterstones. It was all up there on the top shelf, Catastrophe by Max Hastings. Well, what were these gentlemen saying? Well, you can imagine what they were saying. Germany started it, Germany was to blame. Germany wanted to dominate Europe and the world. Germany threatened Britain, Germany broke international law. In other words, they repeat repeated and are repeating all the arguments which were made on the Allied side um, in 1914 and again in 1919 when the war finished at the Treaty of Versailles. Germany is to blame. That was important because we wanted to get lots of money from the Germans to pay reparations, so to justify these enormous sums we had to make them accept the blame. And it's not often mentioned, and certainly not by the Rogues Gallery I showed you before, that the British blockade of Germany did not cease with the armistice. The blockade by the Navy, the economic warfare, continued from November 11th, 1918 until the 28th of June, 1919. So German civilians, Austro-Hungarian civilians, were continuing to die of starvation through that whole period. Um, it was only when the Peace of Versailles was signed that that was stopped. So, they are repeating, in effect, the arguments of the Allies. It was all their fault. Britain was in the right, Blackadder and the war poets were wrong, uh, meaning it wasn't a nonsensical, absurd struggle. On the contrary, it was a noble struggle. Britain was right to fight, it was not a waste of life, and the British generals were not donkeys leading lions. That was a an attitude to the war which really came through very strongly in the 60s, if those of you were old enough to remember that. Oh, what a lovely war, that famous uh, play and musical and film. Oh, there's Boris again. Yes. So, if we just pop back to 1914, the Times, two days after Britain declared war, the Times said, uh, in an editorial, the Brit quote, the British people are drawing their collective sword in the good old cause. Once again, in the words which King William inscribed upon his standard, they will maintain the liberties of Europe. It is the cause for which Wellington fought at the peninsula and Nelson and Trafalgar, the cause which saw its crowning triumph on the field of Waterloo. It is the cause in which Oliver's iron sides and their French comrades beat the finest infantry of Spain, and for which Drake and Howard of Effingham routed the Armada, the cause of the weak against the strong, of the small peoples against their overweening neighbours, of law against brute force, of the Commonwealth of Europe. Mm. The Commonwealth of Europe. Against the domination of the sword. So that's how the time saw the war two days after we entered it, to rally the troops, rally the nation, so to speak. And of course it's basically the image of St. George protecting the Belgian princess against the German dragon. And this mythology, if you will, this mythos, um, has proved, sadly, all too effective with us English, us Scots, us Irish, us Welsh, but possibly particularly the English, because after all, the cross of St. George is the English flag. Um, this story that we go to defend the poor little weak guys against the big bad bullies, um, it strikes a note somewhere in many hearts, even today. 
and you'll notice that in recent years it's still being used by our politicians to justify um, outrageous uh, incursions, attacks against foreign countries of all kinds. Uh, but that's what it was said in 1914 by this man. He wrote it, Valentin Chirol. He wrote that um, editorial, and these are the various historical figures he refers to, the heroes of uh, British history over the last 400 years or so. So it struck a chord with the English people of that time. And this was the image, therefore, that they were being asked to respond to. There's gallant little Belgium and the German ogre. And then as the war went on, that's 1914, British propaganda, as the war went on into the Americans coming, well, of course the Americans go on a bit cruder, shall we say. And so here's the German Hun Bruce to destroy his mad brute, and here's the princess. Uh, it's almost looking forward to King Kong, isn't it? Um, so Max Hastings, according to him, there's overwhelming evidence that Austria and Germany must accept principal blame for the outbreak, vital to the freedom of Europe that Kaiser's Germany should be defeated. World War One and World War Two are the same, he says, except for the Jewish genocide. That's his view. Um, I disagree with just about everything he says. Um, and the point is here, you see, that we, the British people, are uh, confronted by people like Max Hastings when it comes to explaining the World War, and only by people by, uh, like Max Hastings for the most part. So, just to give you, give you an example, here's BBC History magazine. Was Britain right to fight the First World War? And we, <clears throat> we see they allow uh, another historian who disagrees with Max Hastings, Max Hastings, Neil Ferguson. He says Britain was wrong to go into the First World War. And he's probably the only sort of frontline historian, very well known historian, to come out there very, very strongly and say that because he's got a massive ego. Neil Ferguson, so he doesn't care who he takes on. Um, but they give him three pages in the, BB, in the BBC magazine to put his view, Neil Ferguson, and you think, well, well, that's generous of them. But then they bring six historians against him. And that's quite typical. And that's also what happened, if any of you saw it, uh, in his um, TV documentary, where they had Hastings, who gave his programme, for uh, an hour or an hour and a half uh, last month, and then another one a few days later by Neil Ferguson, who was able to put the other side. But again, Ferguson, interestingly, he took on half a dozen historians who disagreed with him. Well, that was braver than Hastings. Hastings didn't take, despite his name, Hastings, he didn't take on any other uh, historians. All the historians he interviewed, they all agreed with him. But Ferguson, because as I say, he's got this great ego, he decided, I will take on these other six who disagree with me, and I'll also take on an audience of the public. And some of those audience, well, in fact, most of them also disagreed with him, particularly one woman who, frankly, was quite devastating. I think she really set his ears back. Um, but the point there is, you see, that the way these, pro these two programs were set up, Hastings' program came across as sort of confident because it was only putting one view, and he had people who only agreed with him. Whereas um, Ferguson's program came across as disjointed. Um, so many people were disagreeing with him, he looked like the only one who had the point of view that he had, and therefore, can you trust this guy? I would imagine that many of the public watching would think, no despite the energy with which he tried to make his views. However, so in other words, there, again, you have a certain one-sided view in this debate. However, there is something which I agree with Max Hastings about. In, in the March earlier this year, in the lecture at the National Archives, he said that the July crisis of 1914 is the most complex series of events in human history and can make you feel a bit mad. I can only give you my take on it, he says, 
But the evidence is so confusing and contradictory, and the issues are so complex, I think you will find that virtually every student of 1914 is in a permanent state of confusion. Well, you think, well, maybe that is him too. But actually, as we've seen, his view is very uh, definitive. He, he's quite clear that Germany was to blame and Britain was in the right. And this is the view, you see, that we in Britain get over and over and over again. Our historians or Anglo-American historians do not pay sufficient attention or have not paid sufficient attention to what's going on, what was going on in Paris, in Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, the Vatican, um, also very important. Um, they tend to focus overwhelmingly on what was going on in London, Berlin and Vienna and particularly London and Berlin, because this war was seen predominantly as a struggle between us and them, us and the Germans. Why? Because the Germans killed more of our guys than anybody else in that war. Um, and as I'm sure you know, this was the first war which Britain went into as a national, sorry, didn't go into it, it came two years later, 1916, but it was the first war which Britain had fought with a national conscript army. So, whereas the war, that, the, the uh, army that went into the war in 1940 were veterans, were professionals, then, very soon after that, that, that army was more or less destroyed in the first battles, so for several months. And so then conscription eventually was brought in, after a lot of volunteers came along, and by 1916 you had a, a conscript army. It was the first time in our history, really. And so you had people from all parts of the country, all shires and regions, um, all different economic brackets, different kinds of people, a real national army for the first time. And what were they faced with? 1st of July, 1916, Battle of the Somme. Disaster. And the psychic shock of that Battle of the Somme, because of the nature of that army, was so great that today still is why, if you go into any bookshop and look for books on the First World War, you will find reams of books about the Battle of the Somme, or even the first day of the Battle of the Somme. But you will find hardly anything, hardly any books, specifically devoted to the causes of the war, which got all these young men into this mess in the first place. It all has to do with the pathos of the Battle of the Somme and Britain's losses, you see. And also Britain's losses of that old generation and Britain's loss, eventually, even one could say, of the empire. Because in a sense, that war began the end of the empire. It was really the beginning of the end of empire. It was a pyrrhic victory for Britain. So this, this is why this sense of loss is so overwhelming. Um, in British culture, it has remained so since then. Loss on all sides, the, the contrast between what the situation before the war and after the war, the way the changes in values from religion to music and food, attitudes between the generations and so on. So many things, one could go on and on. But everybody felt a tremendous gulf had been crossed. Now, there is a terrific battle going on currently um, these are all the historians on the right who follow the traditional view. Uh, we were right to fight and Germany was in the wrong. And these are the ones on the, um, on the left going down to these two guys um, who are historians who disagree with that view for one reason or another. And it's good, uh, these are people who are contemporaries who lived during the war, and I'll say something about some of them later. But it's good to see that there have been, while these people have been very active, uh, following the traditional establishment point of view, that these people have been coming out with, with new materials. And I particularly draw your attention to a couple of interesting books. Um, John P. McCaffrey, Lord Milner's Second War, and one come, come out quite recently, Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor, Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War. Very readable. Uh, not heavily academic books, these. Very readable books. Um, 
more academic, something I would wish to recommend very strongly is this one, The Policy of the Entente, by Keith Wilson. Um, really excellent book. And then others have come out, American military historian Terence Zuba, questioning the German military strategy upon which much of the uh, establishment view has been based in, uh, for the last 80 years, the so-called Schlieffen Plan, the German military strategy of 1914. He's critiquing the establishment viewpoint of this Schlieffen Plan and showing that it wasn't at all what people have said it was over the last 80 years. So there's really still a debate going on to be had here, you see. But it's a very, imp and it's a very important debate. Those are some of the books uh, I've just mentioned now. Um, we can, I can show you that slide again when I finish. And it's a very important debate for this reason here, I think. George Orwell, 1984. Those who control the past control the future. And those who control the present control the past. So if you want your country to have a particular view that will help you to do something in the future, you need to tell your country a story. You need to give it a narrative of what your country is about. It's an identity issue. Who are we? And if people can accept this understanding of their biography, then it becomes easier for them, as we saw in the Times editorial, when, he, when Cheryl said, we are now going to do the same thing as we have been doing for the last 400 years. Therefore, we must be right, so to speak, and it's right that we do this. So if you are able to control the writing of history through the universities, through the high schools, that you can present an image of your country to the, pe to the people, then you can, that helps you to uh, lead the people into certain geopolitical strategies in the future. And now what is that message which we are telling to ourselves, or is, is being told to us? This is from the Olympics, London Olympics 2012, you probably remember it, some of you. The song Survival by Rock Band Muse, it was played at the Olympics, it was the official song. So this was the song which went out from London to the whole world. Uh, I didn't want to play it because it, frankly I think it's so appalling. And it starts with these kind of sickly sweet string section. No rhythms, no bass guitar, nothing. Just these, these synthesizer string section of some oodling romantic uh, countryside view sort of thing. And then that morphs into a kind of Elton John dum 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 on the piano. And then the rhythm section comes in, and then it goes on into this sort of gigantic, uh, heavy, juggernaut-like thing. And the lyrics is this. Maybe David Cameron could have written them. Life's a race, and I'm going to win. Yes, I'm going to win. I'll light the fuse, and I'll never lose, and I choose to survive whatever it takes. You won't pull ahead. I'll keep up the pace, and I'll reveal my strength to the whole human race. Yes, I am prepared to stay alive. I won't forgive. The vengeance is mine. And I won't give in because I choose to thrive. I'm going to win. I'll light the fuse. I'll never lose. Whatever it takes, you won't pull ahead. I'll keep up the pace. I'll reveal my strength to the whole human race. Yes, I'm going to win. Fight, 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 fight. Win, 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 win. We're going to win. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the sentiments which went out from this country into the world as what we stand for as a people. I wonder how you feel about that. And Cameron followed that up with these words which he said to the CBI, the speech to the CBI on the 19th of November 2012. You'll remember Cameron's slogan connecting with the Olympics was, we're in a global race. And he said to the businessmen gathered there, Frankly, we need this buccaneering, deal-making, hungry spirit now more than ever. Britain's in a global race to succeed today, and you don't need me to tell you that. Every day the people in this room are fighting to win contracts in, around the world. 
You know, you businessmen, what the world, the global race means because you're living it. And I'm here today to tell you this government means, uh, this government gets it. We get that the world is breathing down our back and we get what British business needs. These are the key steps to Britain thriving in this global race. And it's not just about policies, it's about attitude. You need us to be tough, to be radical, to be fast. And I'm going to tell you what that means. This is the message, you see, which we as a people are expected to get from our leader. And we're having an all-out war, he went on to say, on dumbing down too. There's something else you desperately need from us, us the government, that's speed, because in this global race you are quick or you're dead. This is the application of Darwinism to social relations. European legislation holds us back, it clogs things up, so we are fighting back hard against those continentals over there. When this country was at war in the 40s, Whitehall underwent a revolution, everything was thrown at the overriding purpose of beating Hitler, 1940 comes in. This country is in the economic equivalent of war today, and we need the same spirit. And on and on in this vein, you see? This is the same as Muse and Survival. Is this what we want to stand for in the 21st century? But this is the narrative which Cameron feels uh, should underpin our values. Uh, because if it doesn't, he's arguing, the Chinese will defeat us. The Indians will defeat us. But ladies and gentlemen, what are the Chinese and the Indians doing? Actually, they're doing nothing except applying economic theories which we gave them. Just like... We gave them communism. Karl Marx in Manchester. Yeah? We are now giving them capitalism. We are giving them some form of democracy. In inverted commas. So the ideas, again, are coming from here. Ideas mostly stemming from the 18th century. So his notion that the dynamism is over there in China, that the newness is over there in China and India and Asia, this is nonsense. There's nothing new coming from over there. The only thing that's new coming from over there is energy. That's all. Not ideas. They have no new ideas in China, in their economics, in their politics. And we should recognize that. So we should say to Cameron, no to your 18th century ideas, which you're serving up to us again, just like you did 100 years ago. And then that same historian I mentioned earlier, Neil Ferguson, he came along in 2011 with his book, Civilization, a book which he wrote particularly with the Chinese challenge in mind. And he based this book according to what he called Six Killer Apps, no doubt thinking it was a trendy title. And he meant by that that these six things had made Western society strong and powerful over the last 500 years and had enabled it to go forward in the world and assume a position of dominance that it is in or has been in up until recently. And they were competition, science, property, medicine, consumption and work. Well, medicine is actually natural science, so we can take perhaps five killer apps. Yeah? But those those, prop, those uh, elements there, competition, science, property, medicine, consumption, and work, again, these are old concepts. There's nothing new there at all. If you read this, um, uh, Ferguson's book, it becomes quite clear. And although he tries to suggest that these are ideas of Western civilization as against Asian civilization, it, his mask slips at the end of the book, and it becomes quite clear that really these are Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American concepts rather than, let's say, European concepts. So he's really standing up for Anglo-American values. So this has to do, I feel, with the question of identity. This story which we've been told about the First World War. Who am I in this country? In what way do I wish to make some sort of contribution to this country? And who are we as a people? And where are we in our national biography? As you know, we are um, uh, currently we are currently facing, also in this momentous year, the question of this or this. 
are the Celts going to leave us? And this is another similarity, you see, the Scots. Is this another similarity with 1914? Because until the 24th of July, 1914, which is only some, what, 11, 10, 11 days before we declared war on Germany, our cabinet was totally focused on the imminent prospect of civil war in Ireland, not the continent. Will there be civil war in Britain was the question they were concerned with. Will Ulster break away? Will the British army mutiny in order to support the Protestants against the Catholics because our government is pressing for home rule for the Irish? Huge political debate went right through 1914. So the government was really worried about civil war. Yeah? Again, Celtic people saying, we've had enough, thanks with the Union. We'd like to leave now. Um, and as you know, two years later, uh, because the Great War happened and uh, in 1914, and that put a lid on the Irish problem, and really the politicians breathed a sigh of relief, but it didn't stop the problem because two years later we have the Easter Rising. And then uh, six years after that, we had Irish independence. So Ireland was on its way, you see, already in 1914 to break free from the Union. It was the beginning of the end. Only our establishment couldn't see it, didn't want to see it. So we can ask ourselves, well, what does it mean then that the Scots are now wanting to say, we'd like to go back to being an independent country, please? Identity questions. Britain, England particularly, is now coming to a nodal point in its long 1,000 year history since the Norman Conquest. Now, you may have seen this picture. Uh, I can't remember if I showed it to you last time I was here. Um, it's a bit, it seems a bit lighthearted, but actually there's something very serious about it. And because behind this is a very important fact to understand the deep background to the First World War. This comes from a book which is called All the Countries We've Ever Invaded and the Few We Never Got Round To by Stuart Laycock. And there, the countries in white are the countries which have never been attacked by England or Britain. The countries in white, ladies and gentlemen. All the other countries have been either invaded or attacked by us. Think about that. That's quite something, isn't it? That's quite a history. You know, there's not many other countries, and probably, you know, one has to say probably not even one other country that has this background. What does it mean? What does it mean about our ancestors over the past 1,000 years? Why is that? That the only places which we never invaded were places like the Vatican City, Tajikistan, Monaco, Ivory Coast, Liechtenstein. You know? What is that about? Well, I would like to suggest, as my answer for what it's worth, is that in 1066 we have to go back there if we want to find a deep background to the First World War. Because in 1914, the British elite, the people who've been running this country since our Civil War, particularly, but right back to the Norman Conquest, our elite, took over this country at that time. They were Normans, as you know, which means they were Vikings. Yeah? Yeah. And they took over this country. And as soon as they took over this country, almost as soon as they took over this country, first of all, they did the Doomsday Book, as I'm sure you know, and they figured out who belongs to, what belongs to who. And then they almost immediately started attacking the Celtic periphery countries. First Ireland, then Wales, then Scotland. <coughs> With Scotland, they didn't succeed. The others, they did, more or less. Not satisfied with that, in the 14th century, they went on to attack the continent, invaded France. For 100 years, they rampaged around France. Speaking French, by the way, of course, because when 100 years of war started, our elite still spoke French. 14th century. 300 years after the Norman Conquest, they were still speaking French. And then after that, they didn't stop. After that, they didn't stop. They went on, and then, as you know, the British Empire grew and grew. It went right around the world. 
And this is, it started out of what David Cameron called the buccaneering spirit. And then after this buccaneering spirit, just like the Vikings, we go where we want and we take what we want. Then in the 19th century, it became a little bit more civilized. And then we decided, well, God has made us the most the superior nation in the world, so we must be God's chosen people. And therefore, it is our duty to help those who are less well off than ourselves and to civilize them and bring them up to our standard. So in the Victorian era of imperialism, then it was noblesse of niche. Then it was, well, now we shall help the dark-skinned people to become at least almost as nice as us. But I'm sorry, India, you have to wait probably several centuries before you can be independent, if ever, actually. So this is a long period of history, and particular groups were in charge of that process. Elite groups. Elite groups who were, to begin with, dynastic, and then later in the 20th century became less dynastic, although you could say in the case of the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, still dynastic. Um, but much more uh, broad spread, widespread these days. Um, this is Samuel P. Huntington, who in 2004 wrote this book, Who Are We? And he was asking the question, who are we, English-speaking people? And what he meant by that was we, white, top English-speaking people of Britain and America, who have been ruling Britain and America since the First World War in tandem, in tandem together through our think tanks, through our secret organizations. These kind of images emerged in the First World War of Anglo-American unity. Throughout the 19th century, Britain and America had been very suspicious of each other because of the American Revolution. But in the 20th, late 19th century and 20th century, they began to intermarry. You only got to think of Winston Churchill's mother, for example. Many married rich, rich American heiresses married poor British English aristocrats. And so they were even genetically connecting. Um, and connecting in very various ways. The Pilgrim Society in 1902 to bring together the elite of those two societies. The Queen is still patron today. Now to see the beginning of this process, we need to just travel back a little to the beginning of the 17th century, to this king, who you probably know, James I, James VI of Scotland. He was the one who brought Britain, England and Scotland together. But he would never have done that after Elizabeth I died without children. He would never have been able to do that unless these two guys had not, behind the scenes, very secretly, made sure that after Queen Elizabeth died, he would become the King of England. This is William Cecil and Robert Cecil, his son. They both became Secretaries of State under Elizabeth I and then under James. And this one here founded the British Secret Service one of whose agents was John Dee, the original James Bond, secret number 007. Right? Now this family, the Cecils, therefore, now, this is the name I'd like you to keep in mind. Yeah? It's very interesting to observe that this family were right there at the, begin the very beginning of British Empire, and they are there again at the beginning of the end of the British Empire 100 years ago. So here we have, oops, sorry, here we have Lord Salisbury, their direct descendants, Lord Cecil, uh, uh, head of the Cecil family, his son, Robert Cecil, his nephew, Arthur Balfour. Prime Minister of Britain three times, Prime Minister of Britain once. There were so many members of the Cecil family in government in 1900 that the media used to refer to it as Hotel Cecil. This is the head of the Cecil family today, Viscount Cranbourne. He was the one who ensured that Tony Blair would not do away with the hereditary peers, which is why we still have 92 blood-based genetic hereditary peers in the House of Lords today. He led that die-hard conservative battle to keep the blood principle in our House of Lords, fundamentally anti-democratic. And then after he did that, he withdrew from the House of Lords and started to attend to his business affairs in Burma. 
So the Cecils are related to all the grand families of Britain, the Grovers, who own Mayfair, Duke of Westminster, Cavendishes, Littletons, Palmers, Gatlin Hardys, Balfour. All these families were intermarried. And they had been used to ruling this country since the 17th century. Now, a couple of very important quotes from Lord Cecil. This is really key, what he's saying in the 1880s to understand Britain's actions which take us into the First World War. When you bring the English in contact with the inferior races, said Salisbury, they will rule whatever be your sensible ground for their presence. Remember, these are people who have been ruling this country for centuries. An intermediate course between military occupation and laissez-faire is what he called for. The Pacific invasion of England, meaning by England, through merchants, engineers, railway builders, soldiers, administrators, and travellers. Once obtain the unrestricted right of access, and in a few years you will govern without ever drawing a sword. So he was not a, 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 averse to using the military, and he often did as prime minister in our small colonial wars. But when he didn't use the military, then he used these other means. And in his book, Splendid on Isolation, this is one of the most important slides I'll show you today. Um, the historian John Charmley, who's writing about British policy in the 19th and 20th centuries, he has a lot about Lord Salisbury and the Cecils here. And Salisbury says to Lord Morier, in, uh, Sir Robert Morier in 1885, Morier was a man with great experience of Russia, and a man very close to the Prince of Wales, who would later become King Edward VII. So Salisbury says, Russia's only weak point was her financial embarrassment. If we become her chronic enemy, it is to that weak point that our efforts must be addressed. We must lead her into all the expense we can, so that a few steps further must push her into the revolution over which she, she seems constantly to be hanging. Russia, he said, was, was really invulnerable to military attack because she was so huge. And so he wanted to devise some other means of securing the road to India. This is the point, you see, that the British elite realized that India was our golden goose, the jewel in the ground, and India must be protected from Russia. Russia was the only threat to India. It was absolutely key that we had to save, or rather, defend India and keep, it, keep the Russians from getting it. And Salisbury said, that time and chance might provide the answer to, the, to Britain's Russian problem, either by revolution, or by Islamic revival, or by war against Germany. So Salisbury was looking into the 20th century and seeing how could Britain retain control of India and how could Britain involve Russia into a disaster of one of these kinds. Well, it's not difficult to see, is it, that that's exactly what happened. At first, in, 19, in 1885, Salisbury did not agree with the views of Winston Churchill's father, Randolph, who wanted us to have, go into an alliance with Russia. Salisbury didn't agree with that. Salisbury said, you can have an entente with a man or a government, but no one except Canute's courtiers ever tried to have it with a tide. Remember King Canute in the old days, back thousand years ago, he was the one who supposedly famous told the, the waves to go backwards, yeah, because he rather fancied himself, but the waves were not too impressed. And uh, Salisbury regarded Russia as a tide, as a natural phenomenon, not as a, as a, as a human phenomenon. And he saw Russia and Slavdom as a natural force, its advance remorseless, moved by the forces which cause vast group populations to overthrow their borders. And, however, two years later, he changed his view, 1887. And this year, ladies and gentlemen, this is the year where in Britain, where in Britain, it really all begins, I would say. The process which leads us to 19, uh, 1914. 
what happens in 1887, to look at what happens in this year in many places, but particularly in Britain. Um, from this time on, Salisbury was prepared to consider a Russian deal. Why? Because of this guy. Dulik Singh was a Sikh Maharaja of the Punjab. The, the Sikhs were Britain's most difficult enemies in India because they're such a martial people. We had the most difficulty in suppressing the Sikhs. And the last Sikh Maharaja in the Punjab, we took him away from India when he was still a boy, a teenager, and we brought him to England and brought him up as a British gentleman. And we thought, well, he'll never be allowed back because we thought he could become a focus, you see, for resistance against the British in India. But would you believe his mother came from India and sort of helped him to rediscover his heritage and then a priest came from India, helped him to do the same, and then he goes to India, tries to get to India, but the British stop him at Aden. And then he has to come back from Aden, that's in South, uh, southwest Saudi Arabia, yeah? he has to come back, and he, he, but he didn't come back to Britain. He, came, he lived in France until his death. And he tried then, using the French and the Russians, Britain's enemies in the 19th century, the French and the Russians, to help him to get back to India. Now that was, that was real warning signals for the British elite. That our worst enemies are cooperating, the, Brit the French and the Russians, to help to bring about a major uprising in India. That was really a kind of warning signal to Salisbury and he realised he had to change British policy. No longer could we remain only in splendid isolation, with no allies with anybody, depending only on the navy, now we would have to come to some kind of accommodation with our former problem, problem countries, France and Russia. And that would lead, 20 years later, in what was called the Dip Diplomatic Revolution, to the Entente first with France, which was a stepping stone to the eventual Entente with Russia. Because it was Russia that our elite were really afraid of, more than Germany. More than Germany. We can talk about after the break. Germany's navy was not a problem, despite what the historians will tell you. Germany's army was not a problem to us because Germany's army couldn't swim. And the navy was not strong enough to defeat our navy. Yeah? Germany's finances were far weaker than ours. That's why they lost the naval race. So Germany was not a problem. Germany itself was only one thirty-third of the world's surface area. We in our empire accounted for nearly a fifth. France and Russia, however, these were big, major powers. And they threatened us in India, and that was the key. Russia, above all, Russia's friendship must be secured. Hence the Entente with Russia in 1907 in the diplomatic revolution, which ironically led to war seven years later. Because the British elite decided to sacrifice, as it were, Germany, with whom we have been friendly, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey had been our friendly countries in the 19th century. In the 20th century, we decided to sacrifice those three, all of them, and instead, we, as it were, got into bed with our two traditional enemies, the French and the Russians, overwhelmingly because, not because we were worried about the French, but because France was Russia's ally. I can go into the reasons for that after the break. But it was Russia that the British wanted to get close to. And from 1887 until 1907, for those 20 years, they did all kinds of very careful and clever steps to get us eventually into this informal entente with Russia, which involved us eventually, through France and its relationship to Russia, in a war which the Russians wanted to have with Austria-Hungary because of the Balkans. Do you see? How tortuous that is, yeah? Russia wants something in the Balkans from Austria-Hungary. Germany is Austria-Hungary's enemy. Russia wants to destroy Austria-Hungary to achieve its aim in the Balkans. Germany seeks to defend Austria-Hungary from Russia. France will then definitely come in to defend Russia because they have a military alliance. So Germany has to deal with France first because the French are faster on their feet. That means they have to go through Belgium. That brings us in. And it's all to do, eventually, 
ultimately with Russia's ambitions in the Balkans. That's how it started in 1914. But what came out of all of that was exactly what Lord Salisbury had wanted in the 1880s. He had wanted a revolution in Russia which would weaken Russia and make sure that Russia was no longer any threat to India in the 20th century and also, particularly his nephew Arthur Balfour, would bring together Britain and America to create the Anglo-American alliance which would dominate the world for the next two, three, four centuries, what's called the New World Order. So I'll stop there, I'll have the break, and then we can carry on with the So I'll go on for about another half an hour, yeah? and then we'll stop for questions, OK? Um, so just to, just to recap a moment, this very important slide here. It's important that we understand that the families which have been running our country for centuries, a bit like the Vatican, they have a very long perspective because they see themselves as having been responsible for this country for centuries. And so they, are, they look at history, those of them with knowledge, I mean some of them just like ordinary people are idiots, yeah? just like you and just like us. Yeah? <laughs> there are all kinds in the aristocracy. But the ones with insight, the ones with knowledge, the ones with historical understanding, they are able to look far into the future and calculate and figure out what it is that they need to do to secure their interest or what they perceive to be the interest of the country. And this is one, uh, particularly with these two Cecils, like I said, two Cecils, Elizabeth I, James I, two Cecils, Victoria. The time of Victoria and Edward VII, yeah? Um, Lord uh, Salisbury and his son, no, sorry, his nephew, Arthur Balfour. So Salisbury had said that um, Britain can only deal with Russia. Remember, these, these two countries, which had expanded so colossally in the 17th century, Britain peripherally around the oceans of the world, Russia across the land, both in the 17th century. Um, and then in the 19th century, they come up against each other, so to speak, around India, the problem of India. So, from the point of view of our elite, they saw their interests and Britain's interests in making sure we kept India as our golden goose and to keep it from Russia. So the way we could do that, they felt, because we can't use our navy, our army was always too small, we can't use our navy to blockade Russia as we've done with so many other countries. So financial machinations, or revolution, or Islamic revolution, or war with Germany, war against the Germans in Europe. That means either Germany or Austria-Hungary. And particularly Austria-Hungary, there's the weak point. Because Austria-Hungary is directly connected to Slavs, the Slavic people of the Balkans. And the nationalism, which was all over Europe at that time, particularly amongst the Slavs in the Balkans, this was the instrument they could use, do you see? This is why Zbigniew Brzezinski, a uh, Polish-American geostrategist I'm sure many are familiar with, Zbigniew Brzezinski describes Eurasia as the modern Balkans because it's so ethnically diverse that you can use all kinds of things and problems and tensions and difficulties and so on. Yeah? You can apply your lever, so to speak, to bring you all kinds of um, yeah, all kinds of benefits from the point of view of the Anglo-American New World Order in Eurasia. Because as we'll see, they regard it as key to world power is to control Eurasia in our time. Just as the British Raj felt that we have to keep India, so today the British and the Americans feel we have to keep control of Eurasia. And that means we have to push Russia back and we have to gain India back into the Raj again. We have to make India our ally against the coming struggle with China. This is looking forward into the 21st century. 
So this is how um, Salisbury looked ahead and Balfour looked ahead. And um, uh, we can then see, let's go, um, uh, in 1890 this map, for example, came out in a, in a British magazine. This is a German copy of it. But the British magazine was called Truth, published by a rather bizarre character, uh, an MP actually, a radical liberal MP. And in this map, this shows uh, the Kaiser's dream, it's called. 1890, the Kaiser had only just become the Kaiser, so he was an unknown quantity to a certain extent. And um, they were already imagining how we could hypnotize the Kaiser. So he hypnotized the Kaiser, and he has a dream. And then out of this dream would come this vision of the 20th century. And in this vision there would be a great war in which Germany would be involved in war with Russia. And as a result of this war, Europe would be transformed, all the monarchies would be done away with and replaced by republics. And Germany would be broken up into various republics. And Russia would not become a republic. Look, Russia would become a desert. And this is the goal, you see that after this great war, Russia would have socialist Marxism injected into it from the West. We often remember that Lenin was allowed to cross Germany by the German High Command, because the German High Command in World War I hoped that Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution would take Russia out of the war, yes? But we often forget that the man who really won the war for the Bolsheviks, the Russian Civil War, was not Lenin, it was Trotsky. Trotsky was the man on the ground. He was the supreme organizer. Yeah? Lenin just stayed back at, at HQ, so to speak, and produced the ideas. Trotsky went out there and did all of the organizing. He was the guy who really was the brain, so to speak, who won that war. And who let him into Russia? We did. We did. We let him into Russia. He was arrested uh, en route from America, trying to get to Russia, into Canada. And he was arrested there on orders of MI5. And then he was released on orders of MI6 from London. The information came to London that this man should be released. And so they allowed him to go on then from Canada onto Scandinavia and then on, onto Russia. So the Germans, for a very, you could say, simple tactical maneuver to get Russia out of the war so they could win the war. Yeah? They send, they allow Lenin to go from Switzerland to Russia. Well, Scandinavia and then Russia. But the British, looking much further into the future, looking at the future destiny of Russia, and of the globe in fact, desire that Russia will become communist. So Lenin, so Trotsky is allowed to go there. And then you see various other ways in which the British and the Americans make sure that the Bolsheviks do not lose the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, as I'm sure many of you know, we helped to build up the Soviet industry and so on and so forth. So an experiment was set up in socialist communism. And this experiment was set up and it was described, um, the experiment was described in this book, in 1893, in London, in a series of lectures, that the Russian national character would be such that socialist communism, socialism as he called it, um, the man's name was C.G. Harrison, that this would succeed in Russia in ways that it could not succeed in the West. So there's, after the next great European war, the Slavs would move on from what he called, not me, he, called their infancy stage into their childhood stage. Just like 2,000 years ago, the Germanic tribes had moved from their infancy stage, from his point of view, through the tutelage of the Roman Empire and the, then the Roman Church into their childhood stage. Yeah? So that the Germanic peoples, including the Anglo-Saxons, would only become adults later on, for example, after the, the um, Middle Ages. So you see, they have a view of microcosm and macrocosm that a nation is the same as an individual and goes through similar stages of development from infancy to childhood to adolescence to adulthood. That nations go through this and then nations also decline. They come to maturity and then they also decline, just like individuals do. This is the picture which these people had. 
Now this man, we don't know much about him, he's quite a mystery, C.G. Harrison. And you can read these lectures in, in this book, they're very deep, very profound. Um, but he has a very particular perspective, and that perspective is the perspective of what I would call Anglo-Saxon esotericism. And we can discern a little bit from his views, because he was a supporter of this new group, 1889, called Lux Mundi, which, which means light of the world, and was a, an Anglo-Catholic, that means High Church, Church of England, esoteric stream. Yeah? The highest level of the, the very opposite of your sort of Welsh Chapel Presbyterian or Scots Presbyterian. The sort of still very ritualistic, ceremonial, um, Anglo-Catholic stream, High Church. And this Lux Mundi was also, Lux Mundi movement began in Salisbury's house. So the Cecil family were also connected to this same movement. I can't say more than that because I'm not aware. I can't say, for example, that we know that Harrison was connected directly to Salisbury. It's a research question. But it's very, very interesting to see that the Cecils identified with, were very interested with um, uh, Lux Mundi. And indeed, when he was Prime Minister, Lord Cecil actually created the founder of Lux Mundi, Canon Gore, Bishop of Worcester. And everybody was absolutely shocked by that because it was, Lux Mundi was, many people thought, would be on the pale as such a new movement. Anyway, I'm just saying that it's interesting to see that the Cecils were involved. The Cecils were involved in science, the Cecils were involved in religion, the Cecils were involved in philosophy, they were involved in politics, they were involved in psychic research, would you believe? You know, these are quite some individuals, yeah? and they have power, and they've had power for centuries. And we need to understand that, because otherwise, um, our, we as a British people are continually manipulated by these kinds of people who believe that their, the, the fate of the destiny of the nation is in their hands. Yeah, there they are. So famous, his face is even on a tin of cigarettes. We can get that today. Uh, that's about for when he was earlier and then older. Now, he, 1909, Balfour had a very interesting com conversation with Theodore Roosevelt of America, former prime president of America. I'll pass that one. And um, in this conversation, or rather it was a conversation by letter, so to speak, they wrote to each other, um, Balfour suggested to, to Theodore Roosevelt, this is 1909, that Britain and America should create an Anglo-Saxon confederation. In the early 90s, Balfour had already realized that war was coming. And by that, he understood that war would be war against Germany, for the reasons I said before, that in order to get close to Russia, Britain would have to make war with Germany. Now, I know that sounds perverse, but you see, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, this is really important to understand for the First World War, the goals, the foreign policy goals of France, of Russia, could only be achieved by war. France needed war to get back Alsace-Lorraine, which it had lost to Germany in 1871, Franco-Prussian War. The Germans were not going to give that back to them. The only way was through war. The Russians could only get what they wanted, which was Constantinople and the Straits of the Dardanelles, where we later fought Gallipoli, for the Russians in 1915. That's what they wanted. They wanted to get their ships and trade out through Constantinople, and they wanted Constantinople because that was a traditional, important place for the Orthodox Church. Yeah? So they wanted that, Constantinople and uh, the, the Straits, and they also wanted a Balkan League under their control, which meant they would have to destroy the Austro-Hungarian Empire to gain the Slavs, all the Slavic peoples, under the Russian wing, so to speak. This would require war. And it meant war not only with Austria-Hungary, but war with Germany because Germany is Austria-Hungary's ally. So the goals of the Austria-Hungarians, sorry, the goals of the Russians, of the French, and of the Serbs, because of course the Serbs also wanted to destroy the Austria-Hungarian Empire, because they wanted to create Yugoslavia, which they would lead. 
So again, the Serbs needed war to achieve their aims. Yeah? So the aims of these three countries could only be satisfied by war. And Britain, therefore, would need to fight against Germany if it was to keep Russia's friendship. And we will see that this was an absolute fixation with the Foreign Office and with the man who eventually led us into the war, the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, in 1914. Anything to, if, to keep the friendship of Russia. We must be prepared to do anything to keep the friendship of Russia. The uh, British ambassador to Russia, I showed you earlier on, to George Buchanan, he wrote continuously in this vein to the Foreign Office in 1914. We must be prepared to do anything the Russians ask if we are to keep her friendship. Which of course means so as not to lose India. Now, back in 1909, then um, Balfour, having, when he was Prime Minister, created the a Committee of Imperial Defence, which was to co coordinate all of the military forces of the whole empire for the first time, to gain them, to put them together to fight this war, because after all, in the First World War, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they also lost tens of thousands for us, and they were never asked. They were just expected to fight her. Yeah? They had to be organized. So he set up the Committee of Imperial Defense to do that. And then he wrote to Roosevelt in 1909. Um, he speaks about what how Roosevelt should be inspired. Uh, he's writing first to the, to the British, em, to the British em, uh, ambassador, and then he, the ambassador is to pass on this letter to Roosevelt. <coughs> how Roosevelt should be inspired to lay the foundation of an Anglo-American um, understanding. And then, I'll just quote a few things from here. It just gives you a flavor of it. It's from the same letter to Roosevelt. In a loose federation between Britain and America, neither country will sacrifice its own individuality. If England and America do not federate, the history of the world will continue to be one of warfare, for a number of powers will be competing for the supremacy. If they unite against the rest of the world, they will be beyond attack. Such a federation will be a sea empire with no land borders to defend. No permanent government will be required, such a confederation would be practically unassailable and would dominate the world. It would practically dictate peace by sea to the rest of the world. The balance of power would be permanently obsessed. This is a, that, by the way, is Bush House, where the BBC was set up, financed by the Americans. So you see Britain and America as Romans at the top there, still there in London. And um, you probably remember at the beginning of this millennium, the big movie, a Hollywood movie, was Gladiator. You want to see Gladiator? Yeah. Great movie from one, one respect, at least one. Um, and you might remember that at the end of the Gladiator movie, the princess gives the dead body of the hero, and she stands up in the center of the Colosseum and she says, Rome was once great, it will be great again. And she's calling, I would say, for Britain and America to stand together against China in another race war. Because that's what the 21st century is going to come down to in the end. And that's what Samuel B. Huntington was writing his book, Who Are We For? And at that time, lots of books started appearing from Anglo-American think tanks and academic circles and so on about the new Roman Empire saying, well, we are the Roman Empire today, Britain and America, or particularly America, yeah? we should accept that. We should recognize that we are that. This is before Iraq, of course, 2000, 2001, 2002. And then, a few years before that, this man, Brian Beedham, had written in The Economist's remarkable article in which he had shown the world as it will be in the 21st century. And you see, it will be divided in new ways, according to culture this time, not according to ideology. Culture and religion, he said, will define the world in the 21st century. And so you see that the Cold War, having only just finished, Bidem separates Europe again and merges Europe, Central and Western Europe, into America. 
and Eurasia is separated off. So this is the orthodox world, defined according to religion, yeah? The orthodox world. Whereas the Catholic and Protestant world is melded into America. And then here we have Islamistan and Confuciania, and here we have Hindu land. So that's his picture of um, the future of the world. That was from 1st September 1990, one week before Bush's New World Order speech, sorry, that should be NWO, to the US Congress. Remember that? Bush spoke about now is the time of the New World Order, yeah? That was the Gulf War I crisis. The 9-11 shock of 1990, you could say, yeah? Because it was delivered, that speech, on 9-11. Literally, 11th of September. Okay, now this is, this is, now we get something much more up to date. And this is directly connected, again, with this whole picture of what should happen to Russia after the First World War. But now we're in the 1990s. So this is two years later, The Economist in 1992. And again you have a picture of the future. The, the world in the 21st century, the disastrous 21st century. And a, a terrible picture of constant war is described in this article. And would you believe the constant wars begin in the year 2011. So in 1992, The Economist, which as I'm sure many of you know, is completely bound into the Anglo-American Power Network, has been since the 1930s at least, um, is saying that this whole situation of world global conflict will begin in 2011 with a military coup in Saudi Arabia. Well, that didn't happen. But there was a military coup in Egypt next door, wasn't there? Yeah? And it's very interesting to see how the whole process which led to the First World War started in North Africa, in fact. The crises in the years before the First World War were in Morocco. And they had to do with French control of Morocco, British control of Egypt, and Italians wanting to gain control of Libya. Libya? Right? So, because the French and the Egyptians had their bit of North Africa, the Italians wanted a peace. So they went to war with Turkey, which was owning Libya at that time. And because Turkey did very badly in that war, the Balkan Slavic countries all ganged together, helped by Mr. Hartwig, remember him, the Russian ambassador? And the, the Times correspondent, Mr. Bourchier. And they got together in the Balkan League, the Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, all these countries, and they attacked, Serbia, uh, they attacked Turkey. Balkan War I, Balkan War II. 1912-1913. Then they fell out with each other. That was Balkan War II. But Serbia got much bigger as a result of this. So Serbia wanted more. And where was it going to get more from? Austria-Hungary. And that led on to the Third Balkan War, which turned out to be the Great War, the First World War. But so here we have again the situation which starts in the Arabic world in Egypt, as it turned out. And then he goes on to describe how, as a result of this, there will be an alliance between the Arabs, the Muslims, and the Chinese. And together, the Chinese and the Muslims in the 21st century would attack Russia. This is not his map. This is a map I sort of put together describing what is described in the article. Yeah? So that the Chinese will take these parts of Siberia, the Muslims will take these parts of Russia. Now you think, no. You might say that, yeah? But ladies and gentlemen, if you go back to the 1880s and you say to somebody in the 1880s, in 20 years' time, Britain is going to be allied to Russia and France, they're going to go, what? Yeah? Because certain people with long range vision, like these guys, have been mentioning now with the economists, yeah? They're saying, this is where we want to go. I hope you're clear, this is not where I want to go. This is where they were saying in 1992, ladies and gentlemen, that things are going to start in 2011. And we saw them start. And we see what's happening now. The isolation of Russia. You heard that word, it's been used a lot this week, yeah? The last two weeks. Russia needs to be isolated. 
because of its crime against Crimea. Yeah? Isolated in the world community because of these very strange circumstances which happened in Ukraine. And it's very interesting to see how people have forgotten the initial conditions in Ukraine. The EU partnership deal back in November. And then the whole process of how the Ukrainian revolution happened and what happened on the streets and who was behind that. And Victoria Nuland, we've all been through this, yeah? These last weeks, so. Yeah? How the West has been involved in all kinds of ways in bringing this about. The role of ultranationalists, fascist groups, and so on. And all of that's forgotten. And instead, the focus is on Russia's crime in Crimea. Well, the same thing happened in 1914. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand was forgotten. Who did that? Who was behind that? What threads led to the young man pressing the, the, pressing the gun, the, the trigger? And instead, when Austria-Hungary said to Serbia, you've been terrorizing us now for 10 years and trying to murder people and trying to do this and that, that and we're not having any more, so we're going to punish you now. We're going to give you a, a slap across the face so you don't do it again. So we're going to have a little war with you. That's basically what the Austrians threatened. Yeah? And the Germans supported them. And what they wanted was a small, localized war to beat up to Serbia, basically, and say, you've got to stop this. Because we can't, we can't go on putting up with this Austria. Because they, the Austrians really felt so ramshackle that you know, if the Serbs keep on pushing them, it might lead to the breakup of the Austria of Austria-Hungary. And remember, Franz Ferdinand, the peacemaker, who had always blocked the hawks in the Austro-Hungarian government, he was now dead. So the brakes were off. And the Austro-Hungarian hawks could now say, right, now is our time to go for the Serbs. And the Germans said, okay, do it, but do it fast. But the Austrians are very, you know, the Austrians are not the Germans. They're not blitzkrieg people. So they didn't do it fast. And they took their time and they dragged it out and so on and so forth. And by that time, the British and the French and the Russians had twigged, this is our moment. We will use this crisis to bring about the war with Germany and Austria-Hungary that we can use to achieve our national goals. And that's what they did. So, um, initial conditions forgotten. They focused instead on the Austro-Hungarian ultimatum to Serbia. Before that ultimatum was given, the British especially said to the Austrians, yes, you're justified in being beastly to the Serbs. The Serbs have been beastly to you. They're dreadful what they've done. But when the Serbs, as soon as the Austrians presented their ultimatum, which was certainly severe and was designed to be, it was designed to be rejected by the Serbs, and then the Serbs very cleverly accepted all of it, except one key element. And that one key element, ladies and gentlemen, was, would you believe, the Austrians said, we demand that you allow Austrian police to collaborate with your police in investigating this assassination. How does that sound to you? Probably be pretty normal today, I think. Yeah? But the Serbs, supported by the Russians and the French, said, no, we can't accept that. That goes against our sovereignty and dignity as a nation. So they rejected, that was the one key thing that they rejected in the um, ultimatum. And that was enough for the Austrians to declare war against them. Because the Austrians were saying, you must accept all of this deal. Or we might go to war against you. And the Serbs rejected war. Because they knew Russia was behind them. And that's what led to the war, bizarre as it seems. If the Serbs had accepted the whole deal, there wouldn't have been any war at that time. Anyway, initial conditions forgotten, but focus on a later event. We're seeing that again today. So, cold, back to Cold War with Russia, push Russia away into the outer darkness, so to speak, and then Russia will eventually be dealt with sometime later in the 21st century by some kind of attack from the south, the Muslim world, or from the east, or both together. And then, Russia having lost all of its territory east of the Urals, so all of Siberia, all of its Asian territories, so that Russia will become just a European entity or state, then 
we find in Foreign Affairs, the leading Anglo-American foreign policy think tank magazine, 2010, why Russia should join NATO. And here, strengthening transatlantic relations. And what this is all about is combining the economies of North America, North America and the EU. You've probably, you've probably heard all about that, yeah? The goal to join, well, not just America, but also NAFTA eventually, Canada, is to join these together. Why? We remember how the EU began as a free trade bloc. And now the goal is to join the Atlantic together. Why? And on the other side of the world, the goal is to join America with these places, the Pacific. Now, these are potential future members, but China, I, I feel pretty sure, will not become a member of this, because China is already connecting with Russia in the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. But at any rate, America is trying to create an Atlantic bloc and the Pacific bloc. And who's the targets of that? Obviously, it's these two, Russia and China. That's what's being set up for the later down in the 20th century, 21st century. It's being set up by the ideas of Brzezinski, which were all there in 1997 in his famous book, The Grand Chessboard. It's really worth rereading re re this again and again, particularly for what he has to say about Ukraine. Because in his book, he's saying that the few, in the future, remember this is 97, yeah? that Ukraine, between 2005 and 2015, should be brought into Europe, into the EU and NATO. And then we should have an axis, France, Germany, Poland, where his family originally came from, of course, and Ukraine. And if we have this axis, where American influence comes in this way, and then sort of goes along this highway and out this way, yeah? This is the new European axis that, that uh, the Anglo-Americans want to create. And that's what we're seeing today. The Ukraine is to be brought into the Anglo-American orbit. Because Brzezinski writes very clearly in his book, with Ukraine, Russia will be an empire. Without Ukraine, Russia cannot be an empire. So here we see NATO's eastward expansion. You remember that the West promised the Russians that it would not advance to um, the borders of Russia. Yeah? This is 1990, remember the Cold War borders? And now here we are. And now Ukraine's been drawn in. And then there'll be Belarus. So we see that Brzezinski is, and his friends are wanting to push up against Russia. Now if we go back, Back to 1902 to 1909, before the First World War, this group of people got together in a bipartisan think tank in London. They were organized by these two socialists, the Webbs, founders of the London School of Economics, Sidney and Beatrice. And they gathered together a kind of brain's trust of people who they thought would help, would help to improve the empire for everybody, including the workers. They thought. Here's Edward Gray, here's Balfour, here's Edward Gray's psychic, Haldane. He later becomes Minister of War when Edward Gray's foreign, minister, foreign secretary. Here's Bertrand Russell, philosopher mathematician. Here's H.G. Wells, here's Cecil, here's Lord Milner, who carries on from, who carries on from um, Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes, and leads the Anglo Americans. Um, Imperial project through the 20, for the first part of the 20th century after the First World War. Here's the Times military correspondent. Here's J.P. Morgan representative banking. Here is right, ultra right wing, absolute fanatical anti German editor Leo Maxi. Here is Milner's acolyte Leo Amory. And here is Halford Mackinder. Maybe that name is not known to you. Halford Mackinder is the father of. Anglo-American geopolitics. And in 1904, he gave a very significant lecture to the Royal Geographical Society called The Geographical Pivot of History. 
And in that, he said that this area here in the world, called the pivot area, most of which is in Russia today, this, he said, is the center of the world, the center of world power, the center of resources, for example. And then around it is an inner crescent of countries, and then outside it is an outer crescent of countries. And he spoke about the sea wolves, which is basically Britain, America, Japan, and in those days, and the land wolves, meaning the continental countries. And that these two groups of countries are always against each other. And the Britain, of course, is the, the sea wolves. So in 1919, he updated his theory of it. And he said that instead of calling it the pivot, he called it the heartland. And he drew this map and he said, this is the heartland area. This is the center of power. So if you want power in the world, you must gain control of this region here. And he, in his book, uh, sorry, in his uh, lectures and uh, writings in 1919, after the First World War, he formulated, he brought his ideas together in a very simple three-part saying, which is really important to understand. Events both in the First World War time and today, in my view. And it's quoted by Brzezinski on page 38 of the Grand Chessboard. Who rules East Europe commands the heartland. So that's the Balkans, Ukraine. The heartland is the area I just showed you, Central Asia. The jumping off point into that region. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. And who rules the world island commands the world. Brzezinski in the, in the Grand Chessboard points out from a modern perspective how important in terms of resources, geostrategic positioning, population, Eurasia is. Or rather the heartland region, yeah? So, hence, in the 1990s, the Balkans, Serbia, Kosovo, the pipelines going across there. And now today we have this massive American military base there in Kosovo. Now, do you remember how Kosovo was presented to us in 1999 in Britain? St. George rides to save the Kosovo Albanians from the horrible Serbs. Do you remember that? That's gallant little Belgium again, 1914. And the British people, again, as I said, respond to that, especially the more liberal-minded people. But behind that is another motive altogether. Now, this gentleman, Guido Giacomo Preparato, anybody heard of him? He was an Italian-American, and he was sacked from his job for writing this book, Conjuring Hitler, How Britain and America Made the Third Reich, published 2005, well worth reading. Brilliant book in many respects. He's an economic historian. And he also wrote an essay you can read online called The Incubation of Nazism, The Critical Act of the Britain's Strategy for Keeping Empire, 1900 to 1941. Well, he was sacked, went back to, uh, America, went back to Italy. And I'd just like to quote you something from his essay, because he, like Brzezinski, is very aware of Mackinda. Mackinda, Alfred Mackinda, the geopolitician I mentioned, is the key... Uh, Strategist. Then and today, the American think tanks are still using McKinley. His ideas have been the most influential in Anglo-American planning. So what does Preparatus say? He says, Britain dreaded the eventuality that there would emerge on the continent a leading national core that was capable of aggregating, gathering around itself, such a league of vassal powers that it would soon turn into a rival empire capable of resisting any blockade, naval blockade, led by England, and eventually subjugating England entirely. The strategic imperative of Britain in the West became transparent. It was to prevent by all means necessary a Russo-German fusion, or Russo-German alliance. And you see that again and again and again in the writings, as I said before, of the Foreign Office, before the First World War. If we don't stay right with the Russians, they will abandon us and they might turn against the Germans. Well, frankly, I think that's ridiculous because the Russians were quite clear that their national goals required them to go to war against the Germans, not to ally with the Germans. 
but in the far distant future, perhaps, after they'd secured their immediate goals, then maybe they could have got together with the Germans. And that's what he's pointing to here. He goes on, Mackinder suggested a systematic and unrelenting policy of harassment against Eurasia, which was to be carried out by grafting land bridges onto the vital nodes of the heartland. These platforms were to be viewed as launching pads, land bridges, for more or less durable incursions against the natives, the peoples of Eurasia, the aim of which was to keep the natives divided and impeded the major powers from rescuing them with an organized counterattack, such as still the policy of the US with the full and committed patronage of Britain. And I would su suggest to you that really this is still the policy which is being followed. Yeah? And that was the policy that Mackinder recommended in between 1904 and 1919 already. Now, on 16th March 2014, this picture appeared in the Sunday Times, article by Dominic Lawson. We all know that family. And there's the picture. Punch Putin, Judy Merkel, but who will play the policeman? <laughs> picture speaks a thousand words, doesn't it? What that picture is saying, and what Lawson is saying, is these two have to be turned against each other, like Punch and Judy. They must not be allowed to be together. And then he's saying, who will play the policeman? That implies who will keep them from fighting. But you can guess who he means that who will play the policeman, right? That's, of course, us and the Americans. But the point, the point he's getting at is that we will not stop these two fighting, but we will, as it were, maintain tension and enmity between them, just as happened twice in the 20th century. Russia and Germany went to war against each other. And on the other side of Europe, here's another picture which speaks a thousand words. We have Cameron, with a big square black screen behind his head, talking to Hollande, who has nothing in front of him, no, no notes, I mean, this is just a, probably the timetable there. Yeah? Cameron has his open book, look at his hand there, he's talking, he's listening, she, Merkel, paying no attention, somewhere else, doesn't look happy, closed book, yeah? The Entente Cordiale, isolation. BBC. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and open up for questions. Just to, to I hope I made clear to you that there were people in our country at the end of the 19th century who had a very long range vision for the goals of this country going on into the 20th and 21st centuries and beyond. And these goals involved the control of Eurasia, beginning with India, by the Anglo-American world, as the beginning of a basis for total world domination, what the Americans call full-spectrum dominance today, um, by the English-speaking peoples on into the future, without any fundamental change in the economic philosophy of the Anglo-American world. And we have to ask ourselves, I think, as, as citizens of this country, uh, although, of course, unfortunately, in the law, we are still subjects. Um, we have to ask ourselves, I think, is this what we want? Is this what we are going to go along with? Because if we continue to go along with our leaders, like Cameron, I mean, what he's saying is no essentially different from what George Gordon Brown said then we will come to, I feel, a similar thing, a similar catastrophe and disaster in our century later on than uh, as our forebears did in 1914. And they only had newspapers to rely on. Newspapers written by guys like Times Correspondents. They had very little real knowledge, the ordinary English, English man or woman had very little access to understanding of the situation on the continent. 
Today we're a bit luckier in that regard. But so it, it's a challenge for us, I think, to um, to wake up to this evolving reality, see what's going on in front of us, which way things are going, and inform ourselves so that we do not go along with it in the way that so sadly so many young people were, I would say, conned into going along with it in 1914. So I'll stop there and uh, ask if there's any questions, please. Oh, has he snookered the globalists? Has Putin snookered the globalists? <coughs> Has Putin snookered the globalists? Well, I mean, personally speaking, in the long run, I don't feel Vladimir Putin is at all good for Russia. In the long run. Yeah. The, short, the short run may be something else. But in the long run, a man like that is not good for Russia, I feel. Well, a man like that is like another Peter the Great. He's and more back than most of politicians well, yeah, around the world. Okay, well, you, but you could say Joseph Stalin had that, but... Was he good for Russia? You know, Peter the Great had backbone, a plenty. He was not good for Russia. He committed tremendous violence against Russia. He was like a Russian super Thatcher who pushed Russia into a, a kind of a stage, you know, far faster and far more violently than Russia was prepared to go at that time, and split the whole Russian culture in a certain sense. Yeah. So. I don't know about snookered. He may have won a temporary victory. Well, Bush would be right at Dan Ross, he's living in Texas. <laughs> yes, we say that. We, we say that. We say that. But you see, but look at the situation in the Middle East today. In whose interest is it actually going? You know? Globalists. Yeah. Right. Well, they're winning. Yeah. But we hope that they don't win. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, as we've seen, particularly with Ukraine, our media here are utterly, totally one-sided, right? You know, I watch, if you watch RT, I, I've been reading what you've been saying by watching RT, mm. and they give that there's a cross-talk in the old different, different goodies on me every night, and you get the right different views straight there. Sure, but unfortunately, RT is still controlled by the Russian government. And if any rate of uh, cultural media outlet is controlled by the government, well, you know, you've got to take that into consideration. So you're definitely going to get a slant with RT like with everything else, you know, like Al Jazeera and all the rest of them, right? So we just have to be aware of that. And fortunately, particularly younger people who have grown up with this whole internet thing, that there's much more sensitivity, I feel, developing. It's a developing capacity, which we are now growing, so to speak, to, to be able to understand what's coming at us through these oh, popular analysis. analysis. Sorry? Isn't the wild card yes. in your analysis yes. uh, the possible death of the dollar? The possible death of the dollar? Yeah, the whole world's in trillions and trillions of debt. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, you know, turn on YouTube, you know, all these channels. Yeah. The ultimate demise of the dollar. Mm. So where, where does that make the way to mm. I mean, you know, that's like an elephant in the room, isn't it? Do you, do you really think that the powers that be have not factored that one in? You know, look what, think back to 2008, okay? Think back to 2008 and the global crash, right? Suddenly we saw before our eyes, Anglo the Anglo-American capitalist model seemed to be suddenly powerless, seemed. All these banks going down, all the media people sort of going like this, and you know, it look, and, and then all the alternatives, including on RT, you know, all your Jarrell Soren, Salentes, and so on, all saying, "Oh, this is the end of the capitalist system." This is, you know, what happened? Where are we? We're six years on, and suddenly we are told optimism, upsurge, yeah, and then we see the what I showed you before. This putting together step by step, inexorably, just like the European Union of the trade bloc in the Pacific and the trade bloc in the Atlantic. Why are the Americans doing that? Do you not think that this might not be connected with potential weaknesses in the dollar situation? I, I would suggest that certainly they factor this in. You know? They play chess too. Alex. Uh, I don't know whether you've uh, 
something is important, or failed to mention it, just a year before 1914, there was a monument and event on Jekyll Island, yes. the creation of the Federal Reserve. Um, surely one aspect of uh, the war was the fact that the globalists mm -hmm. were able to create their own money and finance both sides and create them billions, trillions of profit. Oh, no, yeah, no question. I mean, certainly the, uh, another very important thing, of course, in this whole period was the gold standard and how the, if you observe the development of the gold standard from 1870, when not so many countries were on it, to 1914, when almost all, all the main countries were on it, yeah? And then, as you say, the, um, the bringing together uh, or the, the emergence of the Federal Reserve in that incredibly devious way in which that was done in between 1910, I think it was Jekyll Island, and then 1913, the Federal Reserve, um, the way Will Wilson and his advisor, Colonel House, brought that about and the powers that behind them. Yeah, this is definitely aimed at the First World War. Definitely. They had to prepare the finances for the First World War just like they had to prepare the diplomatic situation for the First World War, you see. They had to prepare the alliances with France and Russia, which they hadn't had 20 years before. They also had to prepare the money. So where did they, that come from? Partly it came from South Africa. We've forgotten the Boer War, haven't we? The no, Boer, who's interested in the Boer War today, yeah? But I what was... I, I what? was arguing that in, in, in the problem, yeah, certainly. <laughs> I'm glad you were, yeah? I'm glad somebody is. But the Boer War was all about gold and diamonds, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I nearly got shot down. So the British, the British was 220,000 against 60,000 Boer farmers. 450,000 were the total amount of troops we put in there, and he, by the end of the war, 450,000. And they couldn't beat them, they had, they had to burn the farms down and get the women and kids in concentrated camps and send a lot to India and never came back. Yes. Now that, that's the British infamy, that's yes. what's in the book. Absolutely. Really, well, you're talking, quite right, you're quite right. I talked to a British squad in it, he said I was talking treason about getting to. <laughs> Well, the next time any of you come across somebody down the pub who has made points like that, or the kind of points that Max Hastings would make, you see, when they would go on and on and on about German uh, autocracy or German uh, militarism and so on. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not, an, I'm, not a, I'm not an apologist for the German Empire. That wasn't a wonderful place to be either, yes? But Germany in those days, in some respects, was in fact more democratic than us. If you look at the state of socialism, if you look at the state of democracy in Germany then, and above all, the Germans had been involved in no major conflicts between 1871 and 1914. Compare that to Britain. How many wars were we involved in between 1871 and 1914? The Max Hastings is, forget all about that. They don't it's mention. reminding me of something I've forgotten, because I think I might have mentioned that there were other three very important uh, assassinations or attempted assassinations of what I call peacemakers, okay? And that's again a kind of a smoking gun because one of them was um, Rasputin. Now you, you, all, you all have heard of Rasputin, yeah? He was eventually murdered in 1916 and it only came out, by the way, in 2004 that the thing that finally killed him was a bullet right here by a British Secret Service agent. That came out in 2004, we had to wait 80 years for that truth. And then the BBC revealed it on a Time Watch program, right? So the Russian bundlers couldn't manage it. It was Oswald Rayner of MI6, bang, here. Yeah? But, but there was an assassination attempt on Rasputin in July 1914 by a so-called crazed woman. Yeah? Now who was this crazed woman? She was a follower of a particular Russian bishop called Iliador, and Iliador was like this with Grand Duke Nikolai, who was the chief of the Russian army. You know, ultra conservative, ultra anti German, anti Austro Hungarian, pro war, pro pan Slavist. Rasputin wanted, he was not a nice man, Rasputin. I'm not, again, not an apologist for Rasputin. But you can't take away from him, he wanted no war for Russia. He said, if Russia goes to war, we're finished. If Russia goes to war, the Tsar will die. Yeah? So he didn't want war, Rasputin. And he had power, he had influence, so they wanted to kill him. The second one was the Frenchman, Caillot. And it was very interesting how he wanted to make peace with Germany. 
who was a very influential French editor, and then bizarrely, his wife was arrested for murdering another French editor who had accused her, who had said that he was going to publish very French, perhaps some people would say, love letters and what have you and personal documents before they got married. Yeah? So she, it was a kind of a uh, um, crime de passion. Yeah? So that trial obsessed France and ruined Caillot's career. So that put him out of the way. And the last one was another Frenchman, Jean Jaurès, the Labour leader, greatly loved and respected in France and a great peacemaker. And he was killed just, I think it was two or three days before Frank, well, no, wait a minute, it must have been July the 30th, 30th or the 31st, I can't remember now. But France mobilized on the 1st of August, like Germany did. So just before that, he was killed by a right-wing fanatic while having a coffee in a coffee shop in Paris. The guy just walked up and shot him through the window. So you see that these peace, the people who were, who were in positions where they could make peace were taken out. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, could that occur now? Could uh, Russia, Ukraine, or Syria head towards full war footing and it could es escalate into even a World War Three situation? Could, could that occur? Or are they just say that? Personally, I don't think so, no. I, I, I don't, I don't expect there's going to be a, a, a world war coming out of this. Not, not at the stage that I illustrated before. Yeah? I think that's some way further down the line, is, is, the, is what I was reading from The Economist. Yes? Um, this is a kind of preparatory stage in a certain sense. Yeah? Um, I don't sense that they want to take this to war yet. Although, having said that, apparently the Americans are going to go ahead with uh, fairly large scale maneuvers which had already been planned um, and they're going to go ahead in July in Ukraine. So in, in July we're going to see American troops in western Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. The, a lot of esoteric sort of websites and magazines I've been reading, the third, the, the World War Three seems to be coming up time and time again, mm. although people are preparing mm. the populace to think in that respect, and I mean, you look around the world, and it doesn't seem at all likely in the world we're living, but when you, when you consider that the globalists are, and the, the money men are moving towards that area, yes. which is the original heartland area, the yes. source, yeah, indeed. And that's, that's where they all come from, and you, yeah. didn't, you didn't mention that, yeah. I thought, wow, that's, that's where it, it was supposed to originate. Yeah, but I think I think when the if, if there is to be a, a world conflict, let's hope let's hope we, we can manage to avoid it. Yes, then it, it's going to, the plan I would say is it's going to involve China. Right. So the Chinese are then going to be asking themselves, are we prepared to go into such a conflict for the sake of Ukraine? I doubt it personally. You know, but if you're looking at a country like Iran, that's much more important for China. And certainly, as you say, Central Asia is, a, is an area where China has direct interests. Yeah? The whole Indian Ocean region as a sort of frontage of Central Asia, of the Heartland region, Chinese Navy moving in there in a big way. Now. And the Americans very much concerned about that. I just find it, I mean, I, I'm only, I don't know what to make of this, but I just, I can't help thinking it's just so interesting to see this, this track, what's going on with this mysterious airliner situation. Oh, is happening right there in the yeah. Indian Ocean, you know, which is really the area. Have you thought of Diego Garcia? Well, uh, yeah, people have re referred to Diego Garcia, right? Which is another tragedy. We know that story, right? It still belongs to us legally. Well, look, there was, I mentioned earlier on, I mentioned earlier on a, a Times, um, uh, Times correspondent, and there was another Times correspondent who was a military correspondent of the Times. And he, his name was Colonel Reppington. Yeah. And by the way, he was the man who first, who first put together the secret negotiations between the British military and the French military and the Belgian military. Belgium, remember, was supposed to be neutral, right? So in 1905-06, he, the Times military correspondent, put those talks together. Now then, in the First World War, you can read his diaries, which are now published, and it is utterly sickening, frankly, to read of the endless parties and dinners and buffets and you name it, you know, going on while the most 
yeah, it's appalling like slaughter going on over, like over the channel. So much money. Yeah. So much time. Yeah. Let's divide the world up as, as a fun of games. It's like a big game of risk. Yes. And it's going on into the future. I'm just saying, though, that, that when you read something like that, you realise that though they may not be reptilians or extraterrestrials, you're looking at people different. who see other human beings in a completely different yeah. way. No empathy at all. What no more, empathy at all. One more question. Yes. Why do you think Vladimir Putin is bad for Russia? Why do I think Vladimir Putin is bad for Russia? Um, well, as I said, in the long run, right, I don't think, I think Vladimir Putin is a man who is more concerned with we than with I, to make it short. And I think there are many uh, Russian, Russians, like everywhere else, who also want to be in charge of their own lives. When you look, for example, at Vladimir Putin's connection since he became president with the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a fundamentally conservative reactionary organization, as it ever was, and how that connects, or how he's connected with them at the moment. Yeah? I don't believe that he's really a person who is concerned for the freedom of individuals in Russia. And when I say that, obviously I don't mean freedom of individuals in the way a Margaret Thatcher would mean it, yes? I mean simply the freedom that any individual in the world wishes to have for herself or himself. So while Vladimir Putin might, from one perspective, be seeming to stand up to the globalists, um, in the long run, I don't feel that is, or, or the way he is, or what he represents here, I feel in a certain sense, you could even say, the globalists are quite happy he's there. Because he is there, he's the wall they can bounce off. Yeah? He's the other dialectical partner. So he's got to be very careful, and I hope somewhere perhaps that he realizes that, that they think that of him. And then he refuses to play their particular game. Maybe the Chinese will help him to play Go instead of chess. But of course the Russians probably tempted to play chess because they're pretty good at it. Right, 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 right. Thank you all very much. Anyway.